Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to a very special, very short episode 281 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. This podcast is uh, typically a shorter episode like this would be going in my Reflections on Other Podcasts episodes, which go only to my patron. But this episode of the Stark Reflections podcast is sponsored by the patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast to support this podcast over at patreon.com slash dark reflections. And the reason I'm sharing this in the regular feed is I already have another reflection that's going in for patrons. It's a reflection on uh, um, probably about an eight minute segment from the um, book I just finished listening to by Malcolm Gladwell and it's conversations with Paul Simon and, and it's called miracle and wonder and uh, just a phenomenal series of conversations over the course of, of, of a year or so that Paul Simon had with Malcolm Gladwell and one of Malcolm Gladwell's uh, good friends from when he was young. Anyways, that's coming up in uh, the regular uh, feed for patrons over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. But this one right here, this is a reflection from uh, a friend of mine and a client of mine, David Richmond, who is uh, the son of the founder of the uh, 76ers. And I enjoyed uh, his book, actually, which was Wilk Ike and me. And uh, that's not what this is about. Uh, David has a, a, a podcast called Stop Making Yourself Miserable. And this is a very short excerpt from uh, the latest episode, which went live on December 13th, 2022. I'm going to play that and there'll be a reflection on that coming up. As I've mentioned in a few previous episodes, I'm busy working on the higher mind training. And in particular, I'm adapting it for use in a halfway house for people who are suffering with alcohol and drug addiction. The training for this establishment should be in place by late February. As I'm working on it, I'm looking through some of the notes that I've made over the years, and I found a few phrases that I've written that I'd like to share with you at this time. Like a lot of other people who are involved with writing, I always keep a file opened where I can drop in random thoughts that occur to me as I'm working. They don't necessarily relate to anything in particular. If something occurs to me that I feel I should keep, I just write it down and put it away, possibly for later use and possibly not. So before we take our hiatus, here are a few of those random thoughts for your consideration. See if they do anything for you. The first one is follow the heart, not the herd. In this, I was pondering how powerful the herd mentality factor is for us. I remember watching a documentary that featured a Holocaust survivor, and he told a story about something that happened to him during the early days of Hitler's rise to power in Germany. An enormous rally was going to be held with 100,000 Nazi loyalists. They had gathered up about 100 Jews and seated them near the podium so Hitler could vilify them and spew hatred on them during his speech to the crowd. They were instructed to remain in their seats throughout the entire proceeding and they would be taken out at the end. At one point, the gate to the stadium opened and Hitler came riding in in an open car. Instantaneously, everyone rose, giving the Nazi salute and started chanting, Heil Hitler! The survivor then said that the energy of the crowd was so powerful that it took every bit of the willpower that he had within him not to stand up, give the Nazi salute, and join the crowd in chanting Heil Hitler. I never forgot that story because I had spent my entire childhood at basketball games along with 10,000 fans, and I was all too familiar with the power of a crowd. For some reason, for the most part, we humans 
basically like to be just like everyone else. But as the Nazi rally story illustrated, that feeling of safety in numbers is often not what it seems to be. So again, that is a clip from episode, let me just look it up, what is it? episode 54 of Stop Making Yourself Miserable. And that and that's David Richmond. And, and normally his episodes are about 15 minutes. This is a really short one because he's taking a short hiatus over the over the holiday season uh, in uh, early uh, winter and early into January as he's working on another uh, project. Um, but there's, um, well, 54 episodes. And uh, it's really interesting because it's, it's really good food for thought. He takes something, takes a concept uh, from readings and things that he's done, and then, and then he just he reflects on it, which I really enjoy. It's very philosophical. It's very higher mind sort of thinking, uh, and I quite enjoy it. So as I was listening to this week's uh, episode, uh, which is really, really short, and he has some like three or four random uh, thoughts that he reflects on, this one struck a bell uh, in, in a number of ways. And so, I mean, I was at first completely shocked. I had never heard this story before, but completely shocked and, and confused as to how a Holocaust survivor <laughs> who has it was being persecuted by Hitler and having the entire country turned against uh, him and, 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 and many well, you know, millions of others uh, in his country, how he could actually be overcome with the the crowd and want to stand up and salute Hitler. I mean, I mean it just it just it boggles the mind. But there is the power of crowds. Now, uh, David was talking about because his father was the um, uh, Ike uh, Richmond um, who um, you know founded Seventy uh, Sixers, and so obviously David grew up going to a lot of basketball games and and understood the power when the crowd does something. Uh, you feel like you're part of that, and there's this movement. I mean, it really, it really makes sense why the 45th president, who's no longer, you know, the president, continued to do rallies, like basically created this groundswell of rallies around the country to incite people into coming together in in their commonalities of of what he was getting them excited about. And he continued to do that throughout his presidency, which was just, I don't, I can't recall any other president ever doing that. And I was wondering why. And I was like, well, obviously playing off of that psychology of creating this, these groups of people who feel more empowered by being together and uh, potentially moving people beyond logic and reason in emotion, in a very, very powerful way that further cements them into something. Now, I don't want to be political. I am not arguing about uh, the right or wrongness of that. If you know me, you probably know where I stand on that. I'm not very subtle about it. But what I'm commenting on is this, the human psychology that's at play there and just how powerful that is. Obviously, he knows it and is playing upon that. I mean, how does this relate to us as writers? Because this isn't a political podcast. This is a podcast about writing and creativity. And it plays really similarly when you think about it. When you think about the crowd and what everyone's doing and what everyone's talking about and what everyone's getting angry about and what everyone is uh, incited to do, you see a lot of these movements within the indie author community. And, and as creative people, we can get pretty emotionally wrapped up in things. And sometimes we end up doing things and making decisions for the business aspect of our writing and our writing careers and our author path. That is not necessarily the best thing for us, but because we see so many other people are doing it. Well, so many people are going into Kindle Unlimited and they're making bazillions of dollars because that's all I hear about. So I'm going to do it too. 
And, and you get so rallied up and so excited about that that you lose sight of everything else. Or you hear that Amazon is, is, is doing this thing with returns and, oh my God, it's the end of the world. And all of a sudden, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I've seen quite a bit of uh, returns come back uh, uh, from Amazon uh, from the reporting, but it's actually difficult to see the returns when there's a lot of volume <laughs> because they only show you the definitive number. So in certain cases, there's one of my series that uh, was uh, Nocturnal Screams, which is a collection of many short stories. So you, know, you can read them in an hour an hour and a half maybe they're really really short three or four stories in, in, a, in a series and and it looked like people were uh, buying like one of each and then what I was noticing is over the following days because again it's not like I sell a lot of these copies I sell one or two here and there but what I was noticing well it looks like someone just bought them all uh, the first one's free of course so obviously I didn't have to pay for that one uh, but then I was seeing oh uh, and then and then book two is returned and then the day after there's a return on book three and there's a return on book four and the reason I could see those is because I didn't have enough volume on those to see the returns so there's probably more returns happening I get that I know there's confusion that some consumers have and they don't realize that it actually hurts the creatives they think maybe they're just hurting Amazon I don't know but we end up spending so much of our energy and so much of our time getting angry at Amazon and being annoyed about the returns and, and Audible Gate and all the things that we get so enraged about. And it distracts us from the things that are so important. It distracts us from the goals we set. It distracts us from our writing. It takes that away because, we're, you know, we have to cool down uh, to get back into, into the mode. And, and so I was, I was thinking about how easy it is for us to get wrapped up in all these weird movements and conversations. I mean, the latest right now I'm hearing is everyone's losing their mind because uh, the USA Today bestseller list, which is actually indie author inclusive, is uh, shutting uh, down because the, the one woman who's been in charge of it for ex well, many of years got laid off along with a whole bunch of other people. And I'm seeing authors losing their mind because it means they can't now, you know, as, as, aspire to, you know, to do things in the system that drive a whole bunch of sales. And, and then they can add the USA Today bestseller list tag on their, on their books or whatever. And, and I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing the thought because yeah, of course I would love to have something like that. I've never been a New York Times bestselling author. I've never been a USA Today bestselling author. I think I've been a Calgary Times bestselling author. <laughs> Calgary, uh, Alberta, is they publish a bestseller list. But, you know, I've never been a USA Today bestselling author. And I'll be honest with you, I, I mean, I, I sold a, a big enough volume of the Canadian Mounted that I actually went and checked. And I went and checked, yes, because it would be cool. <laughs> Uh, more of an ego stroke than anything, because I don't think putting, you know, USA Today bestselling author Mark Leslie on any book is going to make a difference one way or the other. Because let's be honest, every second book out there has USA Today bestselling author. I mean, I even see authors who, who you know, uh, just published a, a book, uh, you know, a, a week ago, and, and I'm not seeing it trending anywhere. Uh, and calling themselves a best-selling author, so I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a no more. You can just kind of slap on your on your name. Uh, I I mean, I have hit number one in categories. I've been in the top one hundred, and I've been in the top ten of of certain bestseller lists. Not necessarily always Amazon, but it, it's it's a fleeting thing to call yourself a best-selling author. But I'm seeing so many people spending, uh, wasting their energy getting worried and nervous and anxious about something like that that's completely beyond their control. And other people getting all, all worked up uh, about it, forgetting that's not really likely. I mean, yes, if you sell enough to get on the list, that's a good thing because you're probably making a crap ton of money to get those, those kinds of units. But it's the units and it's the new readers and it's getting those readers to continue with you and to sign up for your mailing list and all of those things. That's way, way more important than the the, the vanity aspect of, of being able to say, hey, look, I'm, I was on this list of 150 top selling books last week. Yay. Good for me. And, and again, I'm not I'm not poo pooing that as, as an aspiration, but I. I've never had it myself. It would be nice to have it. And, and again, I'm, I'm one of the authors to be, Ooh, that would be so cool. And I guess I'll never have that now, uh, nor will any of us unless USA Today brings it back. But 
something else will come along. There will be other ways that we can uh, hang up a little shingle and show other people that we're successful. I, I know, for example, I mean, even just on uh, sharing on Facebook and on, on Instagram and etc. the successes that I've been having. And, and again, these are moderate successes. They're nowhere near New York Times, USA Today bestselling, but the moderate successes I've been having with the Canadian Mounted in, in the last little while. And I know it's not going to last long because it's sort of a holiday themed thing, um, gift, etc. That can, that's still distracting. Um, for me, but, but also I I think the point I was, I was, I was thinking of making is that I've been able to leverage it so that other people think I'm doing better than I am, I guess. I don't know what it is. I'm I'm getting a lot of people congratulating me and that's great because I'm, I'm bragging. I am, I'm outright, outright blatantly bragging and sharing the fact that it's got the number one bestseller tag on Amazon and, and whatever, whatever, whatever. But I know that when the USA Today bestselling list thing goes away, there will be other, there will be other things that we can find. There'll be other signs we can hang on, on, on our front doors that show people how impressive and how awesome we are. Of course, the best thing, the best thing, of course, is getting those readers that love you so much that they sign up for your newsletter. Because again, you're in control of that communication to them. You're not leaving it to the New York Times, you're not leaving it uh, to USA Today. I mean, remember that, like you, New York Times, you, there were ways you can game the system and get yourself on the bestseller list for a New York Times bestselling author tag, and and then New York Times stopped counting eBooks and things like that in in their listing, and 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 that was uh, obviously we kind of moved on, <laughs> and and we found USA Today. But, but anyways, I just think. I guess the reflection I want to share here that I thought was important was just how quickly we can lose sight of those things that are really important to us. Let's come back to this, 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 this person who had been persecuted, uh, who, who lost family members, lost everything, was still distracted by the power of the mob of the crowd and and the movement of what was going on there remembering how easy it is for us as humans to fall into that and lose sight of those things that are most important to us specifically to a book to a project to the things that you personally desire your goals etc I reflect back and I often reflect back on, on really great advice. My, my good friend, uh, James A. Owen says when, when he talks about, and this is in uh, drawing out the dragons is never sacrifice what you want the most, for what you want the most right now in the moment. And in, in the example he used in, in, in his story is he was very, very hungry and he had money that could either put some gas in the tank so he could get to a, an important business meeting. And that would have been the long-term thing that he really had been desiring for a long, long time to get him to that next level. Or use that money to buy a hamburger. What he really, really wanted because he was starving was a hamburger. But that's what he wanted in the moment as opposed to what he wanted long-term. And it's so easy for us. And again, if it's happened to you, and it, it happens to me all the time, it doesn't say anything poorly about you. It means you're human and, and you were moved by the crowd. But the reason I'm harping on this for so long is I wanted to reflect on it because I wanted myself, I wanted to remind myself to be aware of it, but I wanted to remind you to be aware of how easy it is for us to be moved by the crowd, to be swayed, by the mob and to lose sight of what's most important to us. And I can't tell you what's most important to you. Nobody should other than your deep introspection and and what you have determined is your own unique author path and author journey. Wow, that was a much longer reflection than I thought. Yeah, I got carried away when I turned the mic on and I just spew without, without a script. But there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this extra episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. A special thank you to all my patrons who make these extra 
uh, episodes possible. I will also be reflecting on, as I mentioned, that interview with Paul Simon, where he talks about writer's block and flow and and the importance of pausing, etc. It was just, there was so much in a, in a really short segment, I had to do it. And this also came up with David, and I thought, well, rather than just do two back-to-back ones just for patrons, uh, I'll release this one out into the into the into the bigger wilds um so that you know all my listeners could get a bit of a taste of some of the episodes that i share in the patron only feed but that is it thank you so much this has been episode 281 i will be with you again in just a few days for episode 282 until such time i'm here to wish you great writing and of course as my longtime listeners will know good stark reflections Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.